before we get started, any questions right off the bat? Okay, so uh, a couple things. Um, worksheet two grades were posted. Um, worksheet three is gonna be due this Friday and we'll see, we'll probably get through worksheet four. If so, it will be due on Friday as well. Um, and then today we'll, um, we'll actually cover all the stuff that you need for project one, I think. Um, and I will at the end of uh, end of the lecture, towards the end of the lecture, I'll go over the starter code and give you some some idea of how to approach that. Okay. So uh, a bit of review from last time. We were talking about the memory hierarchy and we discussed why we need it. And the big reason is that there's a, there's a gap between the performance that we can get in a processor and the IO uh, out to a memory uh, device. Um, and this has just been widening. It hasn't really, uh, hasn't really improved. So we, we talked briefly about um, kind of the, a, a comparison to real real world distances. And uh, the key thing to take away from this is that we're talking about orders of magnitude. Um, we aren't just talking about, oh, three times slower to go out to memory or you know 10 times slower to go out to disk. We're talking about orders of magnitude. And we ended with this, that, um, if your memory subsystem is terrible and really slow, um, that it can actually arbitrarily hurt your performance, um, which is clearly not good. Oh, actually, I did want to, sorry, before we get into things, um, let me pull up the worksheet. Um, So I, I think I kind of wrote this question a little bit poorly. I, I, my goal was for you to compute the speed up per dollar spent um, instead of like performance gain kind of has maybe a connotation of you should take speed up and then subtract one. But anyway, if you, if you have, uh, if you did that, I mean, you get full credit. It's, it's either way. I'll be more specific with like actual test questions of what I want you to compute. Um, oh, and on the worksheet for worksheet two, Adam did go and mark um, things where uh, maybe you were off track slightly, and so I definitely recommend going back and looking at at the feedback. Um, I mean, everyone got like a four or five, so. Um, as I said, it's participation, but we're going to give feedback. Okay. Back to the topic at hand. So let's take a look and see why registers and, and cache are fast. You know, why do we get this, the, these orders of magnitude, uh, better performance? Um, and the first thing to do it is we have to look and see how these registers are implemented. So a naive way of doing this would be, and don't read too much into this, would be just to store the entire register in a buffer um, where we can where you can write into uh, each one of the different registers, and we also read out with this muxer here, um, and this is one way. Um, but it's, it's a little bit 
inefficient. What, what we're actually going to end up doing, a smarter way of doing this, is storing each bit individually. Um, and then multiplexing uh, out like that. So uh, you can kind of see here, this entire line, there's some dots in here indicating that there's more of the same. Um, so we'll store uh, registers zero, bit zero here, register zero, bit one here. Uh, and this allows us to read these bits from the register file in parallel. Um, and we have kind of a, a decoder to tell us which register to put it in. And we have some multiplexers at the other end to give us the actual um, actual values uh, for the read. And you can kind of see here, the write data then gets written to each one of these individually. There's Obviously, this is not a complete diagram. There's, there's more circuitry in here to make sure we're writing to the correct part of our register. But this is, uh, this is, the, this is one of the keys um, to, to make it a little bit faster. What we'll find is that memory is not like this. So RAM doesn't behave like this. Um, it is stored in rows. And we have to pull an entire row down and then read out of the row buffer to get values from memory. Whereas the registers were, you know, we're gonna take up more space to do this, but um, it's gonna be way faster. Another reason why they're fast um, is that they're built on different technology. The registers and cache are built on SRAM, this is static random access memory. And um, it's not dense. We'll, we'll discuss what that means in just a minute. The bandwidth is pretty darn good. So L1 cache, this is some numbers that I got from some blog somewhere. So, you know, uh, mainly what matters is the order of magnitude here. Um, L1 cache to 10 gigabytes per second L2. 80, um, and that's pretty darn fast. Main memory, on the other hand, uses DRAM, uh, dynamic random access memory technology. And there's a few downsides um, and a few upsides. One downside is that we need to refresh it periodically to persist the data. Um, basically, if it doesn't uh, you know, the, the charge will not um, be held for long enough. We'll, we'll have to kind of recycle um, and, and re, uh, rewrite the data back to upon itself every, every few milliseconds in, in DRAM. So that's, uh, that's a bit unfortunate. Um, but DRAM is very dense. What this means, again, we'll take a look at in the next in the next slide. And the bandwidth, though, is going to be much lower. Um, for, for one DIM, we're, we're looking at about 25, 26 gigabytes a second. OK. Now, what does this density thing mean? Well, it literally just means how many bits we can store in a area. Okay, so this is an SRAM cell. It's a diagram. Don't ask me what it means, but there's a lot of stuff here. That's what you need to know, right? There's a bunch of, you know, uh, capacitors. There's all sorts of, um, you know, this is this is a, a fairly complicated. Okay, maybe not complicated if you actually know what you're doing, but this isn't this isn't trivial, and it's going to take up some space. And this is what our cache and our registers are implemented in. Conversely, we have a DRAM cell over here, and you can you can kind of see like there's there's much less stuff, right? Um, you don't have to be a an electrical engineer to to know that this is going to be easier to to do than this thing, and we're going to be able to fit more of these into the same amount of space as 
as uh, as the as the SRAM cells. So DRAM ends up getting packed very very closely to in upon itself. So there's there's lots of um, uh, lots of bits in a very sh small amount of space. Um, SRAM a little bit, a little bit less. So, okay. So why don't we just use SRAM everywhere? Um, part of the reason is it's very expensive. Um, SRAM is much more expensive than DRAM. Um, it's there's just more, uh, uh, you know, it takes more precision. It, it takes more engineering to get that correct. But we also all run into another problem. If we have a not very dense um, method of storing bits, we're going to have to expand the physical size of our memory. So um, if we have a small, like physically small bit of uh, memory, this would be, for example, a cache. Uh, signals are, aren't going to have to go very far. You know, we still have to run up against the speed of light. Um, we can't go faster. Um, but if we have large memory, then we're going to have some issues um, because it's going to take a little while to get from you know the end of our memory into our into our processor. Um, so because, because of the density of SRAM, it's A, going to be too expensive, and B, it's going to just be too big, physically big. And we aren't actually going to get the same performance, for example, if the, if the data is stored here versus way off in the far reaches of the memory. OK. So we've kind of been dancing around the memory hierarchy. But let's let's look at it a little bit more uh, in, in depth now. Okay, um, you probably have seen something similar to this in Comforg, but the idea is that we have um, different layers in our hierarchy, uh, and at each layer is a, it's a different kind of memory technology, and at the top. We have our CPU registers, then we have our caches, main memory, and then lastly, we have persistent storage at the bottom. And there's two, there's three main things that we, we uh, three main metrics that we look at. First of all, capacity. Capacity goes up as you go down the hierarchy. So at the top, your cache is going to be in, or your registers are going to be in the kilobyte range, maybe less. Of, of, uh, of storage. Once you get into the cache, you're talking about kilobytes to megabytes, you know, um, and caches are getting bigger and bigger. So you, I think, you know, you can sometimes see, uh, you know, uh, you're, you're starting to see more larger and larger um, caches mostly in the megabytes range these days, not really in the kilobytes anymore. But once we get out to main memory, now we're talking about gigabytes to terabytes, even petabytes um, in some very, very high performance, uh, large, you know, needing a lot of memory uh, situations. And then lastly, we have the persistent storage, either a SSD, an a hard drive or you know, um, tape. Um, and these are in the terabytes plus range. So uh, obviously the capacity is growing um, as we go down the hierarchy. The other, another metric that we look at is latency. Um, and latency goes down as we go up the hierarchy. So at the very top, the least latency stuff is the registers. Registers are fast. We're going to be able to access the data within a cycle or two. CPU caches, on the other hand, 
not going to be um, as fast, but we're still talking a few cycles, um, not, not, not hundreds. Once we get out to main memory, now we're potentially talking in the hundreds, um, depending on how, how, uh, how, how fast the memory is. And we're talking much more, you know, thousands uh, when, we, when we get out to persistent storage. The last one that we, the last metric that we care about is bandwidth. Um, anything that's on chip, so registers and caches, are going to have much higher bandwidth than anything that's off chip. That's main memory or, or an SSD. Um, if, you've, if you've built a computer before, you'll you'll know you have the little CPU and you put it in a socket. And both of those, the CPU and the cache is on that, on that chip. They're very close together physically. Um, we're gonna have really good bandwidth uh, in this area. But then you have your other RAM chips that you have to like snap into your motherboard. Um, those, are, those are off chip. They're gonna be more, uh, a higher latency uh, and um, less bandwidth. Okay. Here's another way of uh, kind of looking at the, the hierarchy. On the left, we have registers. So register references, we kind of have some, some idea of how large uh, this, this thing would be, as well as the speed to access. L1 cache, um, L2 cache, L3, uh, and then we have a memory bus. So this is the uh, memory um, controller and, and, uh, and stuff like that to get us out to RAM, and then our IO bus uh, to get out to disk. So this would be your SATA a bus or, or other M2 uh, bus as well. And I like this illustration uh, because it kind of shows that they're all connected. Whenever we access something, um, let's just say from disk, it's going to come all the way down our hierarchy into our register. And that takes, it's going to take a little while. Um, but then later on, it's potentially going to still be an L1 cache or an L2 cache, and we're gonna be able to access it from there rather than going all the way out to disk again. Okay, so what happens when we actually do access data? Um, if it's in L1, if it's in the register, then we're, we're, we're even happier, right? It's just there, we, we use it. If, in, if it's in L1, um, that's pretty good too. We're going to be able to um, uh, have some very, very low latency access in in L1 or L2 or L3. If it's not in 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 one of those, then we're going to have to go out on the bus, and we're going to have a high latency access to DRAM or, heaven forbid, it's paged out to disk, and we have to do that. Now. One key thing about memory hierarchies is that they only work if we, a lot of the times, have the data we need in the small memory, uh, the small fast memory. So if L1 cache never contains anything that we're going to need to compute using, it's going to be pointless. We are never going to find what we need in here. So we just built something that we aren't we aren't using. Same thing with L2 and L3. Um, so it's key that we, uh, that we figure out how to make it so that we're storing data that is actually being reused in our computation. And that's gonna be kind of the, a big topic of, of, uh, of the next few lectures. So, 
the main the main like uh, term that we use to describe this phenomena of the the data being uh, um, in in cash where when we need it kind of the, the the reason why this is actually the case a lot of times is because of locality um, so locality is the tendency for our data accesses to be predictable and if they're predictable then we're going to be able to actually store the data that gets reused since we're able to predict in the, to the future so there's two kinds um, of locality there's spatial and there's temporal spatial locality is that the program is likely to access data that is close to the data it's already accessed. So think array access, we access index zero, then index one, then index two. Temporal locality is saying that you're likely to access the same data over and over and over again. Um, for example, maybe you have a global variable that gets used in a lot of computations in your program. And you just keep referencing this global variable over and over and over again. That's just one, one example. Here's a little bit of a, this is kind of a trace of memory accesses um, across time. So these are the different addresses. These are the uh, different, um, this is time. And we can kind of see here is an example of spatial locality where we're accessing let's just say about you know index 35 35.4 or 35.1 35.2 you know it's kind of going up in an array for example as we go through time you can kind of see little bits of that here a little up down up down up down um here uh, these kind of lines are 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 showing us that we also have temporal locality we keep accessing the same thing over and over and over and over again. And then down here, we also have another example of, of, of both of these happening. We have some uh, temporal, we have some spatial. So this is just a, 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 a visual um, illustration of locality. Any questions before we, we discuss this example? Okay. So we're gonna do a little exercise um, and figure out uh, which of these following axes exhibit temporal locality and which exhibit spatial locality which exhibit both, which exhibit neither. Um, so we're just going to assume that all of our, our memory access indices are, are you know, decimal for now. So the first one, we're not going to see anything, right? This is not going to be demonstrating any locality because we there's nothing has been seen before. So there's no way that this can uh, exhibit any locality. What about the second one, the second access on, on two? Which, which of them do you think we're going to, this exhibits? Spatial, exactly. So uh, it's very close to the thing that we already accessed, that we just accessed. All right, three, spatial as well, very close to one and two. 10. Spatial, maybe, I'd say no. Compo compared to 18,000, yeah, but let's just, let's, just, uh, let's just say that these are, you know, we can only, maybe we're storing four values in, in uh, per cache line, for example, and we've only pulled in one, two, three, and four, for example. That's just kind of a, maybe, maybe a way to think about it. Uh, it could be argued, like like you said, this can definitely be argued that we're that we're seeing spatial locality, but you know, let's just say let's just say no for now. What about four? This one, I would definitely say is spatial because it is right next to three. What about this one? Definitely none of them. Yeah, this is definitely way out there. 
totally, um, totally out in the blue. Uh, great question, Wyatt. So the question is, what are these? What are these numbers? So these numbers are going. To, we're just kind of representing. These numbers are representing memory access locations. So we access the kind of index one of our memory and then index two of our memory, index three of our memory, index 10. And that's what these numbers are signifying. Um, and uh, th this is kind of a bit hand wavy still. We aren't dealing in, for example, the actual memory addresses, you know, which would be hex probably in hex or something. Um, but the, the, the main thing that I'm wanting you to get out of this is the idea of like, which one of these demonstrates which kind of locality. 11, spatial, 30. Yes. Yeah, so we'll this is we'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, but when you pull in uh, when you access 10, yeah, you're gonna be pulling in more than just 10 most likely. Um, I'm being a little bit hand wavy still, but that is that is definitely the case. Um, when when you pull in a, a cache line, it'll it'll be more than just a single, you know, 32-bit value. It'll be maybe four, four values, um, or eight, or you know, whatever number. Yeah. So um, 30 is not none of them. One is going to be temporal. Why? Well, we've already seen it. We just saw it up here. So it's kind of we're seeing it again. Two. Yeah. It would, yeah, great, great observation. So the observation is that um, after some amount of time, you're going to be getting rid of one and two. You know, it's, we pulled it into into our cache. Eventually, we're going to get rid of it. Um, when we get rid of it is going to be a topic for a few slides from now, um, and it's very hard. So let's just assume that we never get rid of it for now. That's going to be an incorrect assumption, but we aren't going to be getting rid of it like, like you know, we've only had what four, five, six accesses between this. We aren't going to be getting it. Hopefully, unless our cache is terrible, um, we aren't going to be getting rid of it. So, uh, yeah, as as people on Zoom are saying and in, in here, the second one demonstrates both spatial and temporal uh, because. Well, it's spatial because we just accessed one. It's temporal because we accessed two earlier. Yes. Why is two spatial and temporal, but one spatial? Great question. So why is one not spatial? Is the question? Um, it could be argued that it is, but let's just kind of go back to this diagram. Would you like? Effectively, what we're seeing is, is something along these lines where we're accessing one, two, three, one, or one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And, and we kind of are going to group you know, the first one, two, three, four into its own. This is spatial locality. And then the next, next time we come around to it, this is another example of spatial locality. I would say, you know. It, um, it's being, it's a little bit pedantic, but um, yeah. So three and four, the next ones are going to be both spatial and temporal as well. 10, temporal, um, also kind of spatial from, from here. I'm not sure 
you could argue that this shouldn't be spatial. Like I said, a little bit hand wavy. 190, definitely nothing. 11, spatial temporal, temporal, because uh, we saw it over, over here. Um, and then 12 and 13, we're, gonna, we're just going to categorize these as spatial as well. They're kind of all in this, in this uh, sequence here. And then neither of those last ones are going to be any locality. 182 could go either way since it's close to 190. Um, true, but we also said that three wasn't close to 10. So it kind of just depends on what you think is close enough to call it space, spatial locality. Why are 12 and 13 spatial? Um, well, we access 10, then we access 11, then we access 12, then we access 13. So it's very, yeah, it's, it's very close to the, that sequence. Yeah, other questions? Okay, so how does this memory hierarchy that, that I showed a diagram of earlier actually help us? Well, caches are going to exploit temporal locality by remembering the contents of recently accessed locations. So we access, let's just say back here, we accessed one. Now it's in cache. When we access it again down here, it's still going to be there. So we're able to um, exploit being able to use this fast memory um, and uh, because of temporal locality. Caches also exploit spatial locality by fetching blocks of data around recently accessed locations. And this is, this is going back to the, you know, um, kind of we're pulling in an entire cache line, not just a single 32-bit uh, or 64-bit um, um, item. Uh, so there's a question here. How do we choose where the spatial center is? I guess I'm not sure what you're meaning by center necessarily, but I would say that um, it, it's kind of, it, it, it is like Alex said, kind of a, a rolling window of, um, you know, if we then said, if we then had 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and we went back to 10, maybe we should only categorize this as temporal, maybe not spatial. It, it, it really is just kind of dependent on, on how you want to categorize it. Um, how, how like, how um, that, 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 that came out incorrectly. How you want, how, um, how close you want it to be to categorize it as uh, spatial. And that's not like an exact science. And honestly, it could be argued that everything is just like, yeah, well, a, a lot of things can be both um, if, you, if you think about it in different ways. Okay, so let's talk now about four fundamental caching questions. These are gonna be the questions that'll wrap up this lecture. So they're, they're kind of extensive. There's four questions that we need to care about when we, we talk about caching. The first thing is we need to figure out where we can place a block in the cache. So this is block placement. Um, going back here, since it's small, we're not gonna be able to duplicate the entire memory space of DRAM in our cache. So we have to choose, you know, we can't just do a one-to-one -one mapping. We're going to have to choose where we actually place it. In addition, 
we can place it there, but then we need to actually find it again later on. So this is the second question that we're going to uh, look at. How do I identify a block that's already in the cache? Or maybe identify that it's not in the cache. Third thing to look at is which block should be replaced on a miss. This is a block placement. Um, and we'll see in a, in a few, in a little while, um, that because the cache is smaller than memory, uh, sometimes the cache is going to get full. And we're going to have to get rid of something from the cache so we can pull in a new value that we actually care about. The last question is, what happens on write? This is a write strategy. Um, and kind of the idea is, we should we should we write to the cache and to L1, L2, L3, all the way up to DRAM at the same time? Or should we only write um, when we have to replace a block and we have to evict from the cache? So all of these arise because the, the cache is smaller than main memory. We can't have a one-to-one -one mapping. We're going to have to have um, uh, something more intelligent um, and more difficult. So congratulations. All right, first question, where can a block be placed in the cache? So let's just say we have the following memory space. We're, we have a very, very small computer that only has 32 blocks in it, okay? And we care about block 12. Um, there's, there's three different strategies that we can use to figure out where we put that block. The first strategy is, OK, so first of all, let's just say, assume that we have an eight, eight block cache. So we have, you can, you can tell, eight is less than 32. So we're going to have to figure out some way to map where 12 can go in our eight block cache. The first, the first, um, first strategy is that we can make it fully associative. We can put 12 anywhere in our cache. So we could put it in zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven. Another um, option that we have is direct map. So block 12 can go into block four, only go into block four. So we're going to just mod by however many things there are, uh, how many slots there are in our cache. In this case, there are eight. So we're just going to put um, block 12. We're going to always put it in the block four of our cache. The third option is set associative. So this is where block 12 can go anywhere in our set, uh, uh, set zero. Okay. So we're, we basically divide up our, our cache into four different sets, each one with two blocks in it. And within a block, uh, you, can put, you can put your line, you can put your um, block anywhere you want. So there's four sets. So we mod 12 by 4, we get 0. And then we're going to be able to put it anywhere in, uh, in set 0. Any questions? So one thing to note, um, fully associative and direct map are just special cases of the la last case, the set associative case. So a fully associative cache, for example, is just a cache where the associativity, and, and the associativity is, is the, the number of items in, a, in each set, where the associativity is the same as the cache size. Right, so we just have one big set. A direct mapped cache is a cache where the associativity is one. 
the number of items in each set is just one, you know? Um, so we can think of each one of these different blocks as a different set. Um, you may hear the terminology n-way set associative cast. If you hear this, what it means is that n is your associativity. This is the, the number of items in each set. Um, yeah, so just be aware of that terminology because it's going to show up here. And this is the first problem on the worksheet. Um, so we have a diagram of a four-way set associative cast with 32 blocks. And what we want to do is we want to highlight the blocks in the cast where we can put block 17. So I'll, I'll pull, I'll, uh, let's see. I'll pull up the, my other computer real quick while you guys work on that. Great question. So the question was, does Nway tell you how many sets there are or how many blocks there are in the set? It tells you how many blocks are in each set. Yeah, great, great question. Does that affect the mod? So let's go back to this one. We always mod by the number of sets. So in this case, right, the number of sets is equivalent to the number of blocks. So we just mod by eight. Over here, we're modding by four because there are four sets. Okay, which block can we put block 17 in? I think the first thing to do is figure out how many sets there are, right? So, whoop, I can't even draw correctly, guys. So since we're four-way set associative, each block is going to have four. And then so this is block zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and block seven. Okay. So we have we have eight eight sets. So which one of these sets can we put block 17 in? Set one? I think so. Um, so 17, mod eight. 
that's going to be one. So we're going to be able to put it anywhere. Guys, I think I passed art class when I was in school, grade school. Look at that. Okay, so yes, question in the back. Yeah, down here if you want. Yeah, they're also online if you're remote, so you can you can download them as well. Okay, any questions? Yeah. So just to clarify, this is taking a block from memory and determining where in the cache it's inserted. And this and, and we don't necessarily care about the size of the block, but they are the same size. Because we're saying like block 17 is going into one of these four blocks in mm -hmm. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, so what Jason just said is to clarify, what we're doing is um, from, from our memory, we're trying to figure out where to put block 17 in our cache. So we have a memory, it can be arbitrarily sized. We care about block 17 and we're trying to figure out which place in our cache to put it. And, uh, and then he also correctly stated that we uh, are going to have this, the blocks in memory are the same as the block size in our cache. Yeah. So, you know, let's just say this is eight bytes or something. Um, we would be figuring out where the 17 would also be that, that size. Other questions? I don't really understand why we chose uh, the four to seven section. Why did we choose the four to seven? Okay, so do you understand why we chose, why we identified that we need to put it into set one? Not really, no. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go over this one uh, again. So why do we put it in set one? Because um, that's kind of the key here. We've divided up our cache into eight different sets. Um, we, we know how to do this because we're, it's four-way set associative, meaning that each, each set is going to be four items. So that's all that these little things down here are indicating. And um, kind of going back to, back to this, whenever we have, when we identify how many sets there are, we take the block that we're trying to place uh, we take its number, mod it by however many sets there are, and then that's the set where it can go. So back in this example, um, we had a much smaller cache, uh, but we were trying to place block 12. We modded it by four, which is the number of sets. And in that case, 12 mod four is zero. Over in our, our example, we're trying to place block 17. We have eight sets this time. So we to 17 mod eight, which is gonna be one. And then that's the block where we place it. I'm gonna move on for now. Uh, if you have additional questions, just uh, let me know and um, at office hours. So the next question that we need to figure out is, this is all well and good, good but how do we actually um, find out if a block is in our cache? So we've placed it there. We need to be able to find it again. So um, whenever a memory access happens, we're going to split the memory address into three different parts. We're going to split it up into the, the a tag, 
index and a block offset. Okay, so what does the, each one of these things do? The index is used to find the set where any, any potential match may reside. So this um, is going to be, the, these bits here are going to tell us which block we're going to be in. Um, there are always going to be, be multiples of two. So we can just select out a, a, a set of bits, and that's going to tell us which, uh, be able to identify which block we're in or which set we're in. Um, it's equivalent to a mod, except for less computation. Then um, we're going to check the tags in parallel. So we've we've used the mod. The mod loses us information, right? So there's a lot of things that n mod um, n mod eight is going to be one, right? So so there's going to be a lot of these that are going to be mapped to the same set, and we need to check and see if any of the tags are equal. So if any of these are the same. And that's going to tell us whether or not we have the item in the cache. If it does match, so if the tag matches to any of the things in there, we also have to check if it's valid by looking at the valid bit. So there's some situations, maybe this memory was accessed uh, and written to from another processor, another core. Um, then our valid bit may, may have changed. It may be invalid now. We have to check that. And if it's valid and matches, then we use the offset to index into the block. Okay. So here's here's a diagram of of a memory address up here. Um, in this case, we have just the byte offsets, which is two bits. We have the set, which is two bits. And we have, you can kind of see here, there's four sets. Two bits is going to be able to index into four sets. Um, so we look at these two bits. It determines which one of these sets we care about. And then we have two different, two, um, two, two, two uh, items, uh, two data blocks. Um, in each one of these sets. And we use the rest of the 28 bits to do a tag comparison. So we take, we look at the tag here and here. So let's just say we're looking at set three, right? We, we take the tags, we compare them, see if either one of these are equal. If they, if either one is equal, then we're gonna use it. Um, and we're gonna say that it is a cache hit and we're gonna, use this multiplexer to sort of pull out the correct data. So here's another example, kind of the same diagram, a little bit, a little bit written a little bit differently. We're, we're taking the index bits that determines which one of the sets we go to. And then we compare the tag to each one of the different tags in our set. In this case, there are two items in our set, so we compare the tags, and then we use the offset to index into the data block to get our data. And you can tell here there's eight, eight uh, things. Probably, maybe these are eight words in our block. So we're we're actually indexing into the four word in our uh, in our block. Uh, yeah, so this cache line, it's containing more than one byte, um, making this offset necessary. So that's going to, this is going to allow us to, to index in to the correct bit of our cache. Okay. Questions. Yes, sorry. Where does the tag value come from? Good question. It just comes from the memory address that we're accessing. So, 
how how do we generate from that? Ah, I see. So how do we get the tag from a memory address? I think it's easier to see from here. So we have, in this case, we have a memory address. Um, and sorry for the blurriness. But the tag is literally just going to be the top 28 most significant bits. Another way of thinking about this is if you actually, you know, do the math and do a mod by four, you know, let's ignore the byte offset. If you do a mod by four, it's effectively equivalent to chopping off the last two bits. And then the tag is everything else. Um, great question. So this brings us to having to calculate um, how many bits are in each um, each one of these things. How many are in the uh, index, how many are in the offset, how many are in the tag. And uh, the kind of terminology is that this is the, the cache geometry. So let's just figure out how, how to compute these. First of all, let L be the number of cache lines. Okay, so back over to here, the number of cache lines would have been 32. Um, B is the cache line size in, um, uh, and then A is the address length. This is pretty much always 32, unless I say differently. And then W is the associativity. So the index is just going to be uh, the number uh, of cache lines divided by the associativity. So uh, over here, let me actually do this. Over here, we have the number of cache lines, this is 32, divided by eight, which is the number of sets, or divided by four, sorry, which gives us eight. And then log two of that is three. So we're gonna need three bits to index into this um, this cache. Offset bits are going to be log two of B. So just we need to be able to index into each single byte of our uh, cache line. So that's uh, that's given by log two of B. And then the tag bits is just A. So thirty two minus both uh, index and offset. All right, so let's just do a quick sample problem. I'll, I'll pull up this slide deck again with the formulas. Why are there so many animations? There we go. All right, so Okay, what do you guys get for index? How many bits do we need for the index? Ten. Yes. So since we're direct mapped, W is going to be ten exactly. So um or not 10 one good grief w equals one 
seek direct mapped. Uh, so log two of 1024 is 10. Okay, what about O, the offset? How many bits do we need for that? It's log two of 32 should be five, right? That one's probably an important one to know about. If you, if you know any of your it, uh, um, two's exponent, that's one that's important. And then I think we can all do subtraction. What do we get? 17. So back to Connor's question, You're Connor, right? Yeah, okay, so back to your question, right? How do we know which ones to pull off for our tag? Well, we just do these computations. We find, up, oh, take the first 17, that's our tag. Okay, uh, another example. Oh yes, question. Uh, for, for, for this here, because you should always assume 32 unless I say it differently. Yeah, <laughs> great question. Yeah, so the question was, how, why, do we, why do we know that it's 32? Just assume it's always 32, unless, unless uh, I say otherwise. Okay, next one. We have a 32 kilobyte direct mapped cache with 64 byte cache line. We need to compute the index offset and tag from these. I think the first thing to do is compute L. So what is what is L? L is the number of cache lines. How can we get the number of cache lines from the data that we have? Yeah? Yes. So we take our number of the size of our entire cache, divide it by however large each, each line is. And you get something. Um, Is it like, what'd you guys get? I'll just pull up the, my answer sheet. Give me a second. I guess I should, you know, memorize the answers, but that sounds like too much work. I get 512. Okay, what is, what is W? 
W is one since it's still direct mapped. B, 64, okay. Then we just do the computations. Um, back. Um, Five twelve, which is nine. Agree. Um, B or sorry, O. What is the offset? How many bits do we need for this? This one is six. Yeah, it's just two more, uh, two times than two times what we had in the previous one. And then T is still going to be 17 because um, that's how subtraction works. Oh dear. Sorry. All right. A is the size of a cache line. So the address link, or sorry, not the cache line. It's the size of the address. In this case, 32 bits. Yeah, unless I say it differently, which I don't see happening. Yeah, any questions? So we aren't going to go through, we'll continue discussing the project later. But I do want to highlight that you do have to do these computations as part of the project. Let's go to main.c. Look here. First thing you got to do, first to do in main, calculate the line size and the number of sets. And you're given, let me make it bigger. You're given your cache size, you're given the number of lines, you're given the associativity. Uh, and you got to compute the line size and sets from that. So, again, uh, we'll, we'll continue talking about the project, I guess, next Monday. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll extend the deadline out another week or so. A uh, question on the last problem. Um, how am I supposed to be reading the 32,000 divided by 64? Because you're getting 512 from that. And that's 500. So how, is there something uh, yeah, about so that? How, division? Did, how did I get 512 and not 500? So yeah. the, the trick is this little I. Um, so let me, where's my, it's a kibby byte, not a kilobyte. Um, so, so let me just over here, K I B one oh two four bytes. Okay, okay, if, thank uh, you. I'll extend uh, Jake. Uh, I'll extend the deadline for the project. I think we'll finish the worksheet today. Bytes. I always use K I B when I care about you know it being. Clear. KB would be 1,000 bytes. Kind of the reason that this happened was because the you know the people who regulate the SI were like, why are you using KB when you care when you want 1024? Also, marketers they would say kilobyte, but really mean or and and assume that you thought that it was this but actually mean this because then they have to, you know, they can, they can make less memory and such. 
exactly it's a standard thing you know we want the kilogram and the kilobyte to be the same thing or the same metric prefix but because 10 base is totally not useful in computer science where we were like okay screw you we're going to make a new one kibibyte also mebibyte kibibyte they're, they're kind of stupid when you say them so i just write them out and they're all multiples pretty much of one or two four. So great question. Yeah, that's <laughs> not exactly clear to see. Okay, so last question, and then we'll we'll be done for the day. You have a 32 kilobyte cache, 2048 lines, four-way set associative. Um, yeah. So Carter, this, to answer your question, the, the worksheet we're doing right now is worksheet five. Because four doesn't exist. Okay, so um, L is the number of cash lines. This is just given. W. In this case, we're, we we get four because um, of the associativity. B is the cache line size. So um, we need to compute that, right? Oh, um, good question. So Carter, yeah, go to the website. Sorry, I'll, I'll post, I'll add the canvas thingy in a, tonight. Uh, okay, what did you guys get for, for B? I already gotten a number. 16, maybe, let me just check. Yeah, which is, as you said, um, let me let me actually just do this, 32 KIB over 2048, 16, and then it's plug and play from here. I is just going to be log base two of Twenty forty eight over four. Which is back to nine. So this five twelve log two five twelve of two five twelve offset log two of the of uh, sixteen, which is four. And then the uh, the subtraction. which is 18, right? 19? 19. Clearly I can't do subtraction. Okay. All right, we're a little bit over, sorry about that. Um, you're dismissed. If you have any questions, I'll stick around for a minute. Regarding the project, um, are we restricted to C? So you 
don't have to use C if you don't want. The starter code is only C. It won't compile if you use C++ features. Um, but if you want to use C++, you can modify the make file and uh, uh, have it install. Uh, actually, G++ is already installed in the greater script container. So you can use C++. You just have to do the conversion to make sure that it's using the right compiler and everything. 